Hola Pulso Fam, this is Maribel. What does it mean to be something, to have an identity? And what is it that gets to decide that identity? Is it our parents, our language, our blood, or the world around us? This can be a complex question for many Latinos. For me, when I was growing up, I was an immigrant to the United States, and I landed in the middle of a very white area where the only two real identities were white or black. And so I had to assimilate and shed my layer to fit in. When I did that, it made me lose who I really was. And it almost cast this shame on my identity because I felt like I couldn't really be my true self. I had to become somewhat of a chameleon to actually fit in with my peers. And that can have a really devastating effect as you grow older. Today on the podcast, producer Charlie Garcia has a story about one Latina's journey to find her own authentic identity. This is the Pulso Podcast. Stay with us. The story starts with Melina Garza, in the car on her way to middle school, with her uncle and her dad, so excited for the first day of class in the new town her family just moved to. She looks out the window of the car to see giant pine and oak trees for the first time in her life, a completely different landscape from the desert shrubs she grew up around living along the border. They drive right up to the front of the school, walk in through the big glass doors and through the clean, beautiful hallways to the office where she's about to get her new class schedule. Melina is so excited to get going, to meet new friends, to start a new life. But as the receptionist walks off to get her papers, her uncle kneels down and looks at her. He pulled me to the side and he told me, Mija, I want you to not forget who you are and where you came from. You're Mexican and you should be proud of it. 11-year-old Melina looks back, confused and unsure of what to say. Then her dad chimes in. Yes, but she needs to like hide it. They don't need to know you're Mexican. You don't have to say anything. And I was like, why do I have to hide it? Well... Dad knew best, I mean. Melina doesn't know it yet, but she's about to walk into a chapter of her life that will challenge everything she thought she knew about herself and what it means to be Hispanic. A chapter where she'll have to fight for the right to claim her own Latinidad and her own identity. I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, affectionately called the Valley. Or as her dad describes it. So far down south that white people think it's Mexico. (laughs) (laughs) And she was loving life there. I always tell people I have two homes. I'm the, the one I'm currently in and then where I was born and raised. Grew up with lots of cousins, lots of tias and tios. And she had a weekly tradition with her grandparents. Every Sunday, eat at Diaz Diner. What would you eat there? Pancakes, you know. Every time? Every now and then I'd switch it up and get some tacos, potatoes. Mostly pancakes. Mostly pancakes, yeah. (laughs) Then they would go back to her grandparents' house. And while the adults talked, Melina would go on adventures through the attic. Finding old, old things like antique stuff from the 40s, like an old sewing machine. Bringing something to her and her telling me about it. It was always an adventure. I was always finding new things at grandma's house. Melina and her grandma had a special connection. I was always her favorite because I looked like her. (laughs) She was a badass. (laughs) She was a poor woman, worked on a ranch. She killed snakes with her bare hands like that woman. (laughs) No one could compare to her. But even though she loved visiting grandma, sometimes it was hard to understand everything because Melina couldn't speak Spanish. So they all had to speak together in Spanglish. And she didn't speak Spanish because her parents, both from Mexican descent, had made a point to always speak English in the house. They wanted to make sure their kids were fluent in English first. They grew up in the generation where you speak Spanish, you get punished. Growing up in the Valley wasn't like being from the U.S. or Mexico. It had its own culture, its own flavor of life, and in some ways, even its own language. A lot of words I didn't know in English because, you know, we would just switch. So it's almost like Spanglish was your native language. Yeah, I'd say it was. 11-year-old Melina was loving life, 
playing with her friends, spending time with her grandparents, and eating lots of pancakes. She had no idea that her life was about to change in a huge way, because all wasn't well in that little paradise of the valley. Cartel people were moving in. Um, My dad decided it was time for us to move up north and away from the valley because he was terrified. He actually worked as a border patrol agent. So he saw a lot of bad things that cartel did to people, especially women, young women. So he did not want me there for my safety. This was like the biggest change of my little 10-year-old life. I was just kind of excited for like the journey. Like I'd never left the valley, but then like the reality kind of set in for me. Like I'm leaving my friends. I'm not going to have any family over there. And I'm not going to see my grandparents too. But there wasn't much she could do about it. It was happening whether Melina liked it or not. And so the family moved 10 hours north to Keller, Texas, a suburb in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. They went from a house in the valley to a little one-bedroom apartment with beige walls and musty carpets. Her parents stayed in the bedroom while Melina slept on a couch in the living room. There were no more hangouts with friends, no more Sunday pancakes with grandma. In just a few weeks, her whole life had changed. And this is how we arrive with Melina walking through the big white halls of her new school on her way to class, after receiving those words of warning from her uncle and her dad. Other than trips across the border, Melina had never been outside of the valley. She'd never been outside of her community before. And now, it feels like she's entering a whole new world. The first thing I noticed was how nice all the buildings were. They had fancy, like, projectors and Promethean boards. That was my first introduction to being like, oh, wow, is this what it's like to, like, be around people who have money? And the fancy projectors aren't the only difference from her school back in the valley. There's another big change. My class was all white, like not even any African-Americans, no Asians, no Indians. It was all white. I was the only one there. For the first time in her life, she's all alone. After growing up with children just like her in the valley, she's all of a sudden different. The only minority in a school full of rich white kids. I became a target on the second or third day of class. I kind of felt very singled out. I would cry at night because I felt like no one wanted to be my friend. People were just making fun of me and my accent and like not being able to say certain words. To say that Melina's having a hard time fitting in would be putting it lightly. It feels like she's been dropped into a new country where everything's different, even the language. The hardest one was asking some girls for a chongo during PE class. And they're like, what is that? I don't know. I'm like, it's a chongo. It's like you you use it to put your hair up. And they're like, do you mean a hair tie? I was like, what the hell is a hair tie? (laughs) I'd never heard that before. So it was like kind of like both of us being really confused and like, no, you're wrong. It's like, no, you're wrong. Like, what is that? (laughs) But the strange thing is the kids in her class, they know she's different, that she looks and speaks differently than them. But since Melina comes from an indigenous background, and people often mistake her for Asian, her classmates don't actually know she's Mexican. And although she isn't really hiding it, she still remembers her dad's warning from the first day of school and never advertises the fact that she's Mexican until one day. This one kid in my class was being super racist. And I'm like, do you not realize you're talking to like a Mexican person like right now? And he's like, you're not Mexican, you're Asian, you're Japanese, or you're Korean. And I was like, what do you mean I'm not Mexican? I know what I am. I've always been this. Everyone in my hometown and my family considered me this. For the first time in her life, her own identity is being challenged. Imagine how you'd feel if you introduced yourself and then someone insisted that you were wrong, that it actually isn't your name. At first, you might try and fight it and tell them they're wrong. But what if others insist the same? So much of our identity, of the way we see ourselves, is actually gathered by how others see us, what we are in the eyes of the world. And for Melina, something that felt unshakable, her Latinidad, started to tremble. And this only makes her problems worse at school. Word started going around since I was like the target, called uh, Beaner, Wetback, 
a lot of Mexican jokes, like uh, bad ones, racist ones. Yeah, it was hard. Did you feel an urge to try and assimilate in some way? No, I actually got angry and I kind of wanted to stand out even more. If they're going to like isolate me, then I'm going to be like worth isolating for, I guess. So she sticks it out. And for the next few years, she stands her ground in this new world that's so different than her, where on one hand, her heritage is denied and on the other, it's used against her. I can't help but think of my own high school experience here, growing up in Georgia. I'm half Colombian and half white. I didn't grow up speaking Spanish or around many other Latinos, so I wasn't hanging out with the Latino kids at school. But one look at my face, and you can tell I'm not white. I remember being called racist names by my friends and trying to play it off like I didn't care. I remember how eventually I gave up telling them that I'm not Mexican, I'm Colombian. And I remember the rage I felt the one time someone referred to me as Spick. I still feel it. One day, sitting in class, Melina has a stroke of luck. The teacher calls a new student up to the front of the room, a student that looks a lot like her. She's introduced as Ingrid, a new Mexican exchange student. Melina lights up. Finally, after years of not fitting in, of being alone and not feeling seen or understood, she'll have someone like her around, someone who will finally get her. I was so happy because she was in like a good chunk of my classes. So I kind of like warmed up to her. I was like, oh, hi, I'm Mexican too. But Ingrid's response isn't what she expects. She was like, you're not Mexican. I was like, what? Melina's shocked and not sure how to respond. Here's like the only person that I thought would like understand me and I'd have some kind of common ground with. And she was like, no, you're not. That made me question really hard everything that I was. And it got to a point where I got, you know, embarrassed. I guess I did the one thing that my Theo didn't want me to do. I was embarrassed that I was Mexican. I mean, was I really Mexican? Like, the white people didn't see me as Mexican, and now, like, even this Mexican classmate of mine didn't see me as Mexican, so I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. This leaves Melina even more confused than before. I kind of, like, rejected any Mexican thing. Let's say I go visit family, I'd exclude myself. Am I even, like, worthy of being here? Like, everyone's telling me that I'm not something I thought I was my whole life. Time passes, and middle school comes and goes. High school in Keller is more or less the same, but by then, Melina's become a little quieter and learned to attract less attention. To immense relief, she graduates high school and is able to leave that chapter behind. She decides to go to a local university to study, but she really isn't sure what she wants to do with her life. She tries medicine. Medical terminology, it was too much for me. So I told my parents that, sorry, you will not have a healthcare daughter. She takes a stab at becoming a teacher. I forgot I had such a big problem with authority. And I'm like, wait, I'm going to be the one who's enforcing those stupid rules. I can't do that. (laughs) So that doesn't work either. But then something happens that makes her forget about college altogether. My grandpa died. They had been married for like 65 years and she didn't know what to do without him. And I went to go live with my grandma. She decides to take a year off school to take care of her grandma, her favorite person in the world. And for the first time since she was a little girl, Melina is living in the valley again. Thrust back into the valley, but like without a lot of Spanish. And it was like charades because I, I understood what she was saying most of the time. But it was just responding. That was the hard part. So I had to like pull up Google Translate and stuff. And I was just like, I shouldn't have to do this. I should know Spanish. It's both of my parents' first language. It's my grandma. Like it's what she feels comfortable talking in. Melina makes a decision then and there that when she goes back to college next semester, she'll have a new major. Spanish translating and interpreting. Because she still remembers the words her tío spoke to her on that first day of class. Don't forget who you are and where you came from. Mexico, that's that's where my family is and that's where they came from. It's honoring them 
and my ancestors before them. I want to do good things. I want to make them proud. So she dives into learning Spanish headfirst and figures out very quickly that learning a new language is not going to be easy. It was pretty hard. The first semester I had one class that was all in Spanish. I was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> what are we talking about? My anxiety was like through the roof because like I didn't understand everything. I was like really struggling. But when it gets hard, she always reminds herself of one thing. I kept thinking, you know, about my grandparents and I'm not a quitter. I don't just give up. I persevered through so many hardships and so many things. I don't want to like just bow out just because things are getting a little uncomfortable. And things do get uncomfortable. Not just the studying, but again, Melina has to defend her own Latinidad to the other students. The professor was doing hot button questions. What is someone of, of Hispanic descent but doesn't speak Spanish? What is that to you? One of her classmates responds that a Mexican who doesn't speak Spanish isn't a real Mexican. I was like, what? What do you mean? You're not about to diminish my family and my existence and my identity just because I'm not fluent in Spanish. Like, that's not okay. I was like shouting across the classroom, basically. Do you know why they didn't teach me Spanish? I'm like, because they were punished for it, because they struggled. And they still struggle. My mom still struggles with English to this day. And I'm like, that's not okay. You, and I shouldn't have to like defend my identity and existence just for you to see me as Hispanic. Just like she did as a child, Melina refuses to let others tell her who she is. Every day, she's getting more and more fluent. She's still in school, but already helping Spanish speakers. In the mornings before class, she works at Starbucks. I'll ask them, ¿Hablas español? And they're like, oh, ay, gracias. And they're so thankful and they're happy. And one of my regulars, he's Puerto Rican. I told him that I'm Spanish translating and interpreting, that I want to go overseas and I want to help people. And he told me, you are such a good person. You're going to succeed no matter where you go. And I told him, I'm like, oh my God, you're going to make me cry. And I did cry because like that was the most validating. He was always saying so gratefully, like he was so grateful that I helped him out because he was struggling with English. So I think like we're family. We are all Latino and we should be helping each other out. Do you think you would feel the same if you didn't go through what you went through? It's hard to say. I mean, I don't think I would have understood what other Latinos go through if I had stayed in the valley. It was a bubble. It did open my eyes. As much as it hurt me, I think I needed it to hurt me, to understand more and to appreciate more and try to unite all of us together. But she never got to speak Spanish with her grandma. Soon after, like, I came back home, we found out she had cancer and... She died the following year. Sometimes it's like, was it too late? Like my grandpa, for example, he spoke no English at all. I wish I could talk to him more than just, you know, the hola. And my grandpa, I mean, they have stories to tell. So many stories. But she does find a way to speak with them still. When we go to her grave on Dia de Muertos, I light my candle and I put all of their things out and I speak Spanish and I was like my Spanish has gotten so much better since the last time I talked to you and that's what I say and I hope they're happy and they're proud of me and I feel like them with me and I feel the blessings and you know all the stuff they believed I could do like all their aspirations for me and sometimes her grandma speaks back. The first Dia de Muertos after my grandma died, I actually got a sign. I have fairy lights on my curtain. The only way to turn them on is to press a button on the battery pack. And it's behind my TV after I prayed to them and offered them empanada de calabaza, their favorite. Um, I came back and the fairy lights were on. Like, you, they never turn on at all. <laughs> so I knew that that was a sign from them telling me that they're proud of me for remembering and honoring them. 
Ever since Melina left the valley as a child, she'd been trying to find herself again, to remember who she was. She learned a new language to connect with her heritage and her family, only to find out that the connection she shares with them was never breakable, because it goes beyond words altogether. And as she continues to study, Melina writes poetry to honor her ancestors, not in English or Spanish, but in her native language, Spanglish from the Valley. I'm descended from women tougher than steel, hecho in Mexico, built to endure. <laughs> you can subscribe to the Pulsa Pod wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and tell a friend to give us a listen. Have questions or story ideas to send our way? Send us an email to info at projectpulsa.org. This episode was written, produced, sound designed, and mixed by Charlie Garcia. It was edited by Jackie Nowak and Lisa Larcon. Music composed by Julian Blackmore.